the British Interplanetary was founded in the 1930s, and it has as its mission to sort of raise awareness of uh, space rocketry, uh, space exploration, etc. And one of our um, founders um, in the British Interplanetary Society was the scientist and um, science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke. Um, Arthur C. Clarke came up with three laws, of which the third is probably the best known. It goes as follows. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now, you've probably heard the phrase, it's not rocket science, quite a lot. Um, well, I think that's some people feeling that a rocket science is um, a little bit like magic. What we're hoping to do today is dispel a little bit of the magic for you. I'm really hoping that some of the younger members of the, uh, of the audience today might go away from here thinking, wow, that was cool. I could use a, a career in the space industry. And um, we can help with advice. Come and catch us at the breaks and at lunchtime uh, to advise on sort of uh, academic paths that might get you there. And uh, you never know, um, in a few years' time, maybe you'll um, be a fully fed space geek with a, a crazy spacey waistcoat. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's a hashtag up there if you're into the social media and would like to tweet, but now it's my job to introduce the first of our speakers, um, who is a very good friend of mine. Um, Nigel and I have organised a couple of meetings at the Royal Astronomical Society together in the past. Um, he's an extremely good friend, and Nigel is going to explain why can't we simply fly to space in a plane. It's all yours. Thank you, sir. the Zotter. Okay, good morning. So, <clears throat> as is the case with many science and engineering talks, we start with Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, born in Woolsthorpe Manor near Grantham uh, on Christmas Day in 1642. Uh, later the place where he would do much of his seminal work, understanding the nature of light um, inventing the cat flap, so the stories go. Um, but for the purposes of, of my talk today, um, it's his laws of motion that really allow us to understand the most important concepts that I want to go through. And in particular, it's the third law of motion, which I'm sure is, is probably the most well-known of the three laws, and, and you all know it. So to every action there is always opposed an equal reaction. So I fire a gun, the gun recoils. I step off a boat, and the boat moves backwards in response. I divulge details of a private conversation over dinner, and there's a big reaction and sweat. <laughs> um, so I'd like you to hold that third law in your head, because it's important to pretty much everything that, that I'm going to talk about today. When I was preparing for this talk, I, um, I thought I would check my facts. So my background is in space, satellites, planetary science, and propulsion, not in aerodynamics. So I went down the corridor to see a, a good colleague of mine who is an aerodynamicist, and I said, Andrew, just let me make sure that I have this right, and my understanding of how a wing works is correct. He goes, stop. Um, actually, nobody knows how a wing works, and that was a kind of a crashing uh, reality check for me. It was a bit of a QI moment. Actually, it wasn't entirely true. He was being a little bit melodramatic, I think. Uh, but what, what he was getting at was the fact that there are still debates today over the interpretation of how a wing works. And in fact, if you look in some of the textbooks, you look at space agency websites, they all refer to concepts that aren't actually strictly correct. But thanks to Sir Isaac and his third law, we can understand the way that a wing works very simply. So um, this is some footage which was produced by Holger Babinski at the University of Cambridge. And it's uh, a wing section in a wind tunnel. And we can see that there are uh, streamlines. These are just smoke streams which are giving away the movement, the motion of the air as it crosses over the wing. And if you look at the streamlines coming in from the left-hand side, 
we can see, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on here, but we can see the, um, the streamline here, for example, approaches the wing, it it's, uh, curves over the wing, and then it's pushed down. So for every one of these streamlines that encounters the wing, we can see that it, it leaves the wing at a lower level in that diagram to the level that it arrives at. So in other words, the streamline is being pushed down, and it's the shape of that wing that produces that pushing down action. So that is our action. The action is pushing down on the airstream. So what's the reaction? Something must be moving up. There's a force pushing upwards in reaction, and that force of reaction is the lift force, and that's what causes the wing to lift. It is the same principle that underpins the reason why birds can fly, why we can fly, and why we can sail. Because the sail on a, on a yacht is just a wing rotated by 90 degrees. So you don't need a half hour talk to understand why we can't fly a plane into space, because clearly what's important here is the presence of air, the presence of these streamlines. And we know that in space, there's no air, so we can't get lift. But I think what's interesting is to try and understand what places the limits. How far can we actually go with this kind of, of technology? <clears throat> Flight is about trying to counteract the effects of gravity. We want to get away from the Earth. We want to get away from the planet that's holding us down. But without gravity, winged flight wouldn't be possible because it's gravity that allows the Earth to hold on to the atmosphere. And it's the atmosphere that provides the air, the streamlines that we need uh, in order for flight to take place. These beautiful images from the International Space Station I show because Really, any excuse to show footage like this has to be grabbed. <laughs> but there's a, there's a more serious point, and that is that in, in almost all of these sequences, you can see the very limited extent of our atmosphere. Uh, in many of these sequences, you can see the aurora, and the bright aurora are at about 110 kilometers altitude above the surface of the Earth. So it's the Earth's gravity which we're trying to counteract, but it's the Earth's gravity that holds on to the atmosphere that we need. So as we go higher in this atmosphere, the density of the atmosphere falls off and the efficiency of wings uh, decays. So I'm not going to show many equations in, in today's talk, although I'm happy to talk about the, 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 the technical aspects of this afterwards. Um, but the lift equation is a one which I think is, is really important to, to um, introduce to you. So the lift equation is, as it says, it's an equation that describes how much lift, how much lifting force a wing will develop. And I'm going to talk you through the, um, the equation now. So the parameter on the left-hand side, L, is lift. And that's, that's the important quantity that we want to understand. How much lifting force is that wing generating? And so the units of lift are in newtons. And on the right-hand side, we have an equation that helps us to estimate how much lift a wing is going to produce or an aircraft is going to produce. So I'm going to take the, the um, parameters from the right to the left. So V is the velocity of the aircraft and its wing with respect to the air it's moving through. So that's in units of meters per second. This uh, Greek character here is rho, and rho is the air density in kilograms per cubic meter. So it's the density of the air that the uh, aircraft is moving through. And we know that as we increase our altitude, the air density is going, to is going to decrease. A is the area of the wing. And CL is a parameter called the coefficient of lift. And the coefficient of lift is, is not a simple number that we can simply work out on a piece of paper. It's um, a function of the shape of the wing, um, and it tends to be calculated using mathematical models and also using practical experiments in, wing, in wind tunnels. But CL effectively describes how 
effective the wing is at producing lift when it travels at a velocity v in, an, in a medium of density rho. And this little plot here is um, a, a, an illustration of that coefficient of lift for two different aircraft. And you can see that it's not a constant. It actually varies according to the angle of the wing. So this x-axis alpha is the angle of attack, the angle that the wing makes to the airflow. So the red lines are the coefficient of lift for a little Cessna 172 aircraft, the sort of thing that you can see sort of bimbling across the skies on a sunny weekend. Um, the blue dots are the coefficient of lift for a, uh, a jet aircraft, a fighter aircraft with swept wings. And we can see that the, um, the Cessna has a higher coefficient of lift at low angles of attack, but there's a point at which as the wing angle increases, that lift drops off and the wing stalls and the aircraft can no longer fly. In contrast, this jet fighter has a coefficient of lift that keeps on increasing as the angle of attack increases, and that's very important. This fighter has to be very, very maneuverable. So it needs a shape of a wing that will allow it to adopt many different attitudes, very aggressive angles of attack without dropping out of the sky. But the disadvantage of that shape is that the, the coefficient of lift is actually um, lower overall than the little propeller-driven plane, and that means that these aircraft tend to struggle to fly at low speeds. And that's a problem because one of the fundamental things that you have to do when you land <laughs> is to travel at low speed. It's a, you know, it's a classic element of the landing process. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why in the 60s, um, uh, aerospace engineers developed techniques such as this. This is the F-111 aardvark and it's the first plane, or one of the first planes, to adopt a variable wing geometry. So while it's in high-speed flight and combat, the wings are swept back, and it gives it this very low um, uh, coefficient of, of, of lift, but no stalling. And when it's coming into land, when it's using uh, low-speed maneuvers, the wings are swept forward. So this is fundamental, and it's so fundamental that um, I think a demonstration is, is in order, and I'd like to, to welcome um, onto the floor um, Bob Bailey. Uh, so yeah. so Bob, is, Bob is essentially part of the community that includes aerospace engineers and rocket scientists, but in his spare time, uh, Bob is a master at producing aircraft like this beautiful model. In fact, he's, he's a, a winner of world championships flying such models. What I'd like to invite you to do now is, is to fly this, this Marvelous Launch machine. The model. It's an indoor model which is rubber powered. <laughs> oh. 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 oh, could you get it now? It's right, let's... So while 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 Bob is setting this up, let, so let, let look at this no. flight. I'm going to stay out of your way oh, we'll because you have through. to wrangle your aircraft. <laughs> um, oh. We'll get it there eventually. So I think it's, it's fair to Let's say that Bob again. is used to flying these in large hangars, and so it's, it's quite a challenge <laughs> oh. to do it here. Marvelous. So you'll notice that the aircraft Ooh. is flying oh, very, very slowly. <laughs> so, so if we think about the lift equation, V it's is very crafty. low. So the aircraft is flying yeah, very fun. slowly. Why is it still able to stay in the air? The reason that it's able to stay in the air is because it's very, very light. How, how much does this aircraft weigh? It weighs about um, a gram and a quarter, which is about the same as three paper clips. So, so even though L is very low... <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. 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 Watch. oh, no, oh it's broken, it is. I'm not even though the even though lift is very low. Oh dear. <laughs> is it? Oh no. No mind. Easily oh. mended. <laughs> oh no, an injury. Thank you very much, Bob. That was a. That was a <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Even though the lift of that <laughs> aircraft is low, it doesn't have to produce much lift. It only has to lift a gram of, of weight. <laughs> 
So the issue is that as the aircraft increases in altitude, the density of the atmosphere goes down. If we can't increase the area of the wing during flight, what we have to do is increase the velocity. So to get higher and higher, we need to travel faster and faster. And there comes a point where that's no longer possible. As we get higher, the air density reduces. Engines, unlike Bob's aircraft, which is powered by a rubber band, engines like internal combustion engines and jet engines need air. They need the oxygen, and the oxygen is not available at those high altitudes. Newton thought a lot about speed and altitude, and in one of his very famous thought experiments, this is Newton's cannon, he thought about the situation where he was standing on a very high mountain. As we fire the cannon, the cannonball follows the arc that we're familiar with when we, fire, when we throw a ball, the ball curves down and lands on the ground. Fire that cannon with a little bit more uh, gunpowder and the ball goes further, but it still descends down towards the ground. Fire it with enough energy and the ball still falls but the curvature of the Earth means that the ground falls away at the same rate. And Newton realized this, and this is the concept of an orbit. And on the right-hand side of that slide, you can see the diagram that Newton himself drew in his uh, textbook, the Principia. So <clears throat> there's an equation which we can use to, to estimate the velocity that we would have to be traveling at if we were to be in orbit around the Earth at a radius r from the center of the Earth. And it's this equation here. So the velocity is equal to the square root of the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the Earth divided by r. So what? Well, this is the so what. If you think about the lift equation, we said that the higher that aircraft goes, the faster it has to travel in order for it to be able to generate sufficient lift to remain aloft. It has to go faster and faster as it gets higher and higher. The orbit equation tells us that at a particular velocity, we're not flying anymore. We're in orbit. We don't need wings. And one of the definitions of the boundary that marks the beginning of space is based on this concept. And it's the concept of the Kármán line. And it's this yellow line here, which separates the atmosphere from uh, from space. And it is the point at which, theoretically, the velocity we would need to generate lift equals the velocity that we would need to achieve an orbit at that altitude. It is much higher at 100 kilometers than the typical altitudes that uh, aircraft fly at. Only one plane, and I'll define plane later, has, has achieved any kind of operation at that altitude, and it's the X-15 rocket plane, which we'll look at shortly. Uh, just to illustrate this, I did a little quick calculation. This is a calculation for the Airbus A380. This uh, red line is the um, speed at which the A380 would have to be traveling in order to fly at a particular altitude. And in fact, this green line shows you um, the speed for operation at around about 13,000 meters, which is its operational altitude. And the speed, if you work it out from that lift equation, turns out to be around about 250 meters per second. If we increase the altitude of that A380, if, if the pilot really wanted to give you a good view, um, at about 60 kilometers altitude, instead of 13 kilometers altitude, you would be traveling at orbital velocity in order to remain aloft, and your ticket would be an awful lot more expensive. <laughs> so how do we achieve that, those very high velocities without needing the atmosphere? Um, this is Konstantin Tchaikovsky, one of the founding fathers of astronautics. And Tchaikovsky uh, published what we now know today is the ideal rocket equation or the simple rocket equation. And Tchaikovsky understood very well Newton's third law. And a rocket operates using Newton's third law. This is a Saturn V rocket. It was developed in the 1960s, uh, sometime after Tchaikovsky's death. Um, but as you can see here, the rocket is expelling some material. It's 
hot gas. So the hot gas is thrown out of the back of the rocket by the, by the motor, and you know that if, the, if, the, uh, if there is an action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So as the gas is forced out of the motor, the rocket feels a force in the opposite direction, and that's what generates the thrust. To derive Tchaikovsky's simple rocket equation is not difficult. It's something that you can do at A level, but I'm not going to do it now. All I want to do is draw your attention to the, to, the, to the bottom line, the conclusion. And the conclusion is this, that delta V, delta in, in, in mathematics and science often means a change. So delta V means a change in velocity. The change in velocity that we get by uh, using this rocket is given by VEX, which is the velocity at which the gas leaves the rocket, multiplied by this log term, which is the initial mass divided by the final mass. Now, if you're not familiar with logs and, and algebra like this, don't worry. I'm going to show you a, a, a plot that explains the consequence of this. Effectively, this places a constraint on how much mass we can place into space. This green line is showing us the change in velocity that we get by burning fuel and expelling it out of the back of the rocket. This is our equation, and the velocity that we achieve goes as this ratio, so the initial mass divided by the final mass. So I take the mass of my rocket at the very start, and I compare it to the mass of the rocket at the very end after I've burnt all of the fuel. And and the smaller I can make that final mass as a function of the, of the starting point, the quicker we go, the, the higher the delta V. In order to achieve orbit, we need to achieve a delta V of around about 10 kilometers per second. That's accounting for the energy that we have to spend um, fighting gravity and fighting against the atmosphere. And that means that the amount of fuel that we have in the rocket as a proportion of the total rocket mass is similar to the amount of, of uh, drink in that can compared to, the, to the, the thickness of the can or the mass of the can itself. So around about 95% of that rocket has to be fuel, which leaves very little room for engines, casing, the satellite that you might want to, to launch, and so on. So, there are a number of techniques which engineers use to try and help this situation, and one of the techniques is to use multi-stage rockets. And in fact, this is the only way, oh dear, this is the only way at present of getting into orbit. So in a, in a multi-stage uh, rocket, the vehicle flies through the atmosphere, and at a point where it's expelled a fraction of its fuel, it dumps the empty tanks. And that sheds weight. And it means that you're not using energy accelerating uh, mass that is no longer performing a function for you. So how do we actually do this in practice? Well, uh, a rocket motor is conceptually very simple. Um, it's uh, a fuel tank and uh, an oxidant tank. So we have to carry with us, essentially, the air that we need to sustain the combustion. Uh, and a very powerful motor that is arguably the most complicated aspect of, of the rocket, which forces fuel into a combustion chamber and uh, produces uh, an ignition, which heats the gas, and the gas is forced out of the, the rocket nozzle, and that the, the, the acceleration of the gas in one direction creates an acceleration of the rocket in, in the other. And at this point, I'd like to call for a volunteer because I think it would be quite nice to demonstrate this concept. So hands up if you would like to volunteer. I'm, I'm shocked at the reticence. OK. Ah, OK, thank you. That's better. Uh, so I need somebody who's fairly, fairly substantial and not easily shocked. Uh, OK, gentlemen here. What's your name? Hi, Tech. Nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. So. I actually get stuff quite easily, so. Um. <laughs> Who else had their hand up? <laughs> okay, so um, 
I had to do some explaining on the tube this morning. Um, <laughs> this is a uh, this is an empty and very dry uh, water chiller bottle, and inside here, you're way ahead of me. I'm going to pour. Oh, okay, you, you're going to need those. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pouring isopropyl alcohol. And inside the bottle, we're swishing around the alcohol. Now, alcohol is used. It's strange, I do several demonstrations for student visit days, and they all involve alcohol of some kind. Um, so the alcohol is being swished around in the bottle and is producing a vapor. So I've got a bit of surplus material here. So, in fact, it's like this table. So I'm going to pour that surplus material back in here. And then we will commence the demonstration. Is it the same alcohol as you drink, or is it different? It's, it's certainly not the same alcohol that I would drink. <laughs> Uh, this is isopropyl alcohol. Okay, so, so if you would like to stand here, okay? And what I'd like you to do is stand, you're gonna, you're gonna, so if I can, if you face uh, this direction, in fact, face the exit, okay? But stand here. But if you can stand right here where I'm standing, okay? This, where I'm standing. Come back, come back, 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 back. Okay, the exits, ladies and gentlemen, are here and here. So what I'd like you to do is hold that bottle and hold that cap over the end, okay? So you got up this morning and expected a nice entertaining time in London and now you're standing on a stage with a bottle of highly flammable vapor <laughs> wearing safety gases. I'm not sure, I'm so pleased you volunteered because there's no way I'd be holding that bottle. <laughs> right, uh, okay, so what we're gonna do now is what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to, when I say so, remove that cap and keep your hand out of the way, and you, you'll feel it'll be a whoosh, and a flash, and a little pulse, but nothing else. Please don't drop the bottle, okay? Okay, uh, okay let's do it that way. Is it, can we do it that way? Is yeah, that okay? Yeah, sure. Right, remove the cap. Okay. Remove the cap, hand out of the way. <laughs> Are we okay? <laughs> right. Wow. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, can you uh, can you describe to the audience what you felt apart from horror? horror right. <laughs> um, okay. So the bottle got the bottle got warm. Yeah. And there was lots of light and a bit of noise. But did you feel anything apart from horror? Yeah, there was a bit of a thrust. There was a thrust. Right now, in there, we had probably about half a gram of alcohol. Um, and a bit of air, and it produced a thrust and a lot of noise. In the kind of rockets that are used for launch, say an Ariane, the amount of fuel that's introduced in there is, is of the order of a ton a second. In the case of the Saturn V, which the first stage which launched humans to the moon, 12 tons a second were being forced through that combustion chamber. But this is a combustion chamber. It has all of the properties apart from the motors it's got the main chamber here, and then the narrowing, and through the narrowing increases the velocity of the gas, and it generates uh, at least half of the thrust of the complete reaction. So that is a real rocket motor demonstrated in a lecture theater with the help of a very generous volunteer. Thank you very much. <laughs> Scott isn't showing me his countdown timer yet. Okay, we're good. So. Um, so, you're probably familiar with the term space plane. We've already established that we can't fly a plane into space, but we've shown how you can access space using different systems. Um, space planes are very much in the news now. So the UK is, is embarking on a program uh, of establishing a, a domestic launch capability and looking towards uh, a, a space activity from UK territory, and space planes make part of that uh, possible. But space planes aren't aircraft that we can fly into space, or at least 
They don't use aerodynamic principles to access space. They only go part of the way. So this is the NASA X-15. Uh, and the X-15 was flown in the 50s and 60s. You can see that it has a, a rocket motor. Um, so it has wings because it's launched from an aircraft, very much like uh, the more recent scaled composites, Spaceship One, which is now the basis of Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic business model. Both of these were launched from high altitudes using a conventional aircraft. They have wings and they have a, a, a rocket motor which allows them to, to climb and to reach very high speeds using that rocket motor, but then they follow a free fall trajectory, very much like throwing the ball up into the air. They're not flying at the apex of their trajectory. They're just following a ballistic path like a ball would be. The NASA space shuttle and the Russian Buran shuttle are also forms of space planes, but they use rockets to uh, launch into space. And they're really only planes, they're only aircraft when they come back down to Earth and they use those wings to help re-entry and to allow them to land and be reused. And more recently, this is the Boeing X-37, uses the same principle. So it's launched in a rocket and the wings are only really relevant during the final um, stage of the mission during re-entry. So this is the, the first space plane. This is the NASA X-15 which flew between 59 and 68. And you can see that it's being launched from uh, a high altitude bomber. So this is slung underneath the wing of the aircraft. And at the appropriate moment of time, it's released. The rocket motor fires. It fires for about 80 seconds, uh, during which the speed increases very rapidly, and those wings, even though they're very small, they generate a lot of lift when the rocket is flying at high velocity. And then the motor burns out, and it executes an arc, just like a, a ball or a suborbital rocket would do. And then it uses its wings to come back down and land, hopefully gently, on the runway. So this is a typical flight. In fact, this is the highest altitude flight. This was Flight 91, which took place in 1963. And this took the astronaut, uh, because he is an astronaut, he flew above the Kármán line. He flew above 100 kilometers and therefore earned his astronaut wings. But you can see that the path it takes is not an orbital path like a satellite. It's a parabola, like a cricket ball or a suborbital rocket. So <clears throat> there are current activities going on in the development of, of space planes in an effort to try and reduce the cost of accessing space and placing hardware into space. And one of the most exciting and promising uh, projects is a British project, uh, which is run by Reaction Engines, and it's called Skylon. And Skylon is really a, 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 a true space plane because it launches from the ground. It uses its wings to lift itself through the atmosphere using a revolutionary engine that is both a jet engine and a rocket engine. Um, so during the period of the flight when the aircraft is in the atmosphere, instead of carrying the oxygen it needs to um, uh, generate thrust, it gathers that oxygen from the atmosphere. Once the atmosphere is too thin, the mode of operation of this engine changes, and it changes from a jet engine to a rocket engine, and it has a reservoir of oxygen on board for that phase of the flight. Because they don't have to carry all of the oxygen they would need to pass through the atmosphere um, using onboard resources, the mass of the fuel is reduced, and it's possible to carry more uh, payload. And so this is one of the um, technologies which is being developed could give you an orbital launch capability from a country like the UK, where we don't have those wide open expanses where we can drop uh, rocket stages in as they have in the US and elsewhere. There are other approaches. So I'm sure everybody has seen recently footage from Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX company. So this is a more conventional rocket, uh, and you can see it launching from Cape Canaveral. Thank you very much. And this all looks perfectly normal, nothing to see here. Um, but what SpaceX have been able to achieve with this project is quite incredible, as you'll see shortly. 
Um, Elon Musk estimates that only a small fraction of the cost of his rockets is actually the fuel. Perhaps 9% of the total cost of the rocket is the fuel. Um, the rest is the hardware. And look what happens. The, the first stage, after it's done its job, comes back down to the ground and is landed on the same launch pad or a different launch pad to be reused again. That makes great sense. The way that we use rockets at the minute is a little bit like um, you taking a flight from Heathrow to New York and your airline throwing away the aircraft <laughs> once you landed and then building another one to fly you back. Um, again, the price of your ticket would be catastrophically high if that was the business model that aerospace companies used for flight. Yet, uh, with the exception of SpaceX, when we launch cargo and we launch people into space, we throw away the rocket. The space shuttle was an, was an attempt to produce a reusable launch system. But the problem with the space shuttle ultimately was that its complexity. It was incredibly complex and it was very expensive to refurbish and refly. If you can crack that economic reusability um, problem, then you can reduce the cost of putting hardware into space. And so SpaceX, with its, with its reusable return to base first stage, and projects like Skylon, which are taking a completely revolutionary approach to, to launch, um, are the way forward. And when we look now at, at the most exciting developments in um, space engineering and space technology from the launch perspective, it's notable that it's private companies that, that are really driving this field forward. And it's a, it's a, a very exciting time uh, to be uh, working in the area and have an interest in the area uh, just to see what's going to come next. So with that, um, I hope you now understand why we can't fly into space in a plane um, and how, in fact, we do it now and how we might be doing it in future. So thank you very much for your attention.